Hello, Tabernacle family. Thanks for tuning in for another midweek message. We're in James 1 today and really trying to understand what it means to have your faith under fire and yet come through such a test uh, better for it. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to start this time around just by reading through the text. Well, we'll just kind of break it down step by step. So verse 12, we begin this way. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. We begin in verse 12 with this word, blessed. Blessed is the man. It's actually a, a phrase that you're probably familiar with if you have spent much time in the Old Testament. Uh, think about the psalm, Psalm 1, blessed is the man who, and he gives uh, really six verses of describing this blessed life. Uh, it happens multiple times in the psalms and throughout the Old Testament. Jesus uses this as well. Uh, the Beatitudes, we've, we've talked about this a little bit uh, before, that we have this blessed life. You could translate it happy. So here we are going through this life, and you know the pursuit of happiness is near and dear to our hearts, is it not? Uh, we, we know this as a country. Uh, we sort of know this intuitively. We, we like to be happy. And so James says, happy is the man. That's how you could translate that word, makarios. Uh, happy is the man who, well, who does what? Well, if you read this from the lips of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, it would be like this. Happy is the person who is meek, who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. You remember these things who is persecuted. Wait, wait a second. I mean, at this point, you're, you're probably wanting to bail out. You're like, I think you have the, I think this word does not mean what you think it means. Uh, and yet James and Jesus and the psalmist all say, no, nah, maybe it doesn't mean what you think it means. Maybe we have a different understanding of blessedness. Well, to be blessed is nothing short of to be Christian with all of its entailments. That this blessed life is saying it this way, that the most favorable position that you could be in is, and, and then it's defined in various ways that all essentially mean it's following Jesus. The blessed life is the life who identifies with Jesus Christ, who uses the standard of judgment that Jesus uses. In this case, it says that the Christian is the one who perseveres, right? Blessed is the man who who perseveres under trial, who remains steadfast under trial, who has this heroic endurance. We talked about that in verses 2, 3, 4. Well, this phrase, uh, I think, <laughs> kind of gets widely misunderstood sometimes, perseverance of the saints, uh, that those who are saved by Jesus will persevere to the end. Uh, Jesus says this, right? That the one who endures to the end shall be saved. You, you have all of these things. Philippians 1, 6, I love quoting. Uh, talking about he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. We, we understand that whatever it takes to save you is what it takes to keep you, and so we understand it's grace from beginning to end. Hallelujah. And that it doesn't rule out our own involvement. That you must persevere. So here we are talking about faith under fire. And James is very concerned in this book to say, what are the tests of a genuine faith? That how is it that you are able to differentiate someone who pays lip service, someone who has mere profession, from someone who has possession of this abiding truth of Jesus Christ? It is a good test for America, is it not? Everybody knows how to talk a good game. I love Jesus. And they're sitting there living like the devil. And James says, not so, my beloved. These things ought not to be. So what are the tests of a genuine faith? Well, first of all, the test is that you know what a test is, and you endure under this test. So let's take this and roll it into its context, not just this broad biblical context, blessed is the man, 
but kind of starting from verse 1 and, and running through. Uh, one of the things that I feel that we might lose when we take these small snippets in the book of James is really you, you kind of miss the context. And so recall that James is writing, verse 1, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And so these are believers, and Pastor James is writing to his church, to his parish, who have been dispossessed, who have been abused and dispersed. And so they're all over the Roman Empire, probably mostly just a little bit to the north in Syria. And he's like, I, I know you know what it is to suffer. And I want to remind you what it is to suffer well. Those aren't always the same thing. And so count it all joy whenever you fall. And now he uses in verses 2 and 3 the same two words that he uses right here in verse 12. Now why does he do that, right? He's, he's connecting the dots. He's helping us remember, oh, this is a flow of thought, isn't it? And so count it all joy. Joy. Just remember that word. My brothers, Christians, whenever you fall, it's going to come into all of these different types of, of, well, trials. You could also translate that word temptations, uh, pirasmas. Knowing that the testing, that's a different word, bathmas, uh, of your faith produces all of these good character-building elements right here. Okay, so you have joy, you have faith. My brothers, we're talking about just this fruit of the Spirit, this, this essential Christian character. Well, what happens? To this person who is being tested. Well, this character uh, produces heroic endurance, steadfastness. Now, we just read about that same word again, didn't we? Steadfast under trial, persevering under trial. You'll be perfect. You'll be complete, lacking, lacking nothing. If you do lack wisdom, well, wisdom, why are we talking about wisdom? Look back at verse 3. For you know. You know. The, the reason you're able to bear up under this is because you see the world in a different way, a fundamentally different way from an unbeliever. That an unbeliever is looking really at his environment and blaming his environment. And the believer is saying, I know that God will work all this together for good for them that love God, for them that are called according to his purpose. And so I know who my God is. And I know that these trials, really the problem is not the environment I'm in. The problem is that I'm desiring the wrong things. Well, if you don't know that, ask God for wisdom. And we spend a lot of time in these verses saying that, really, when you talk about wisdom, you're talking about Jesus Christ himself, that you, you, you need more of Jesus Christ. That's the solution. Now, if you're a double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways. I mean, if, if you don't have faith, well, you don't have Christ. If you're a believer, then you turn to Christ. You don't, you don't get past the cross. You run to the cross. And if you're not a believer, well, well the cross is repugnant. And there's always an excuse. And the way of the cross doesn't look appealing at all. You want what you want now. I want my family, my job, respect, justice. Now. Well, you, you follow Jesus Christ, it takes longer, but it ends better. And you're able to see things from a different perspective. That's the wisdom. That's not being this double person, this double-minded person who's unstable in all his ways, right? This, this dai suke is what the Greek says, two-souled psyche. So some of the temptations regard wealth, and you want to have this right standard of evaluation that you're saying, I know I'm here in this trial, and I see God's hand through it. Now, back to verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, this test, you continue to receive test upon test upon test. You will be tested. You will continually be tested until you die. Because when you die, you receive the crown of life. And now comes really the solution as to how you can hope to remain steadfast under trial. This crown of life which the Lord has promised to them who love him. That if you, if you are a Christian, you are one who loves the Lord. That, that if you are going to endure under trial, it is because not you're so good at saying no. It's because you have a bigger yes. You, you understand the ex expulsive power of a new affection. That you have this uh, marvelous love of Jesus Christ. It's the love of Christ which compels me, which constrains me, which hems me in above and below and before and behind, right? 
Uh, th this is how you talk about life. I mean, St. Patrick, you read what he says, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ above me, Christ below me, Christ within me. No wonder he had such a profound ministry. Uh, by the way, he was not Catholic, uh, and he probably didn't drink green beer either, but that's beside the point. So now we come back to enduring trials well. And the way you do that is because you love Jesus Christ. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. The Lord will give that to him. You say, oh, dear Jesus, please help me. Now, moving from the believer to the unbeliever. Moving from the one who has authentic faith, enduring, perseverance of the saint, to the one who will not persevere, who can't hope to persevere. This is the person with inauthentic faith, a spurious profession. And again, let's be gracious here and say, we all stumble. When we talk about the, the one with authentic faith, you know, in verse 12, the point is not that he passes the test because he never sins. That's not the point. We all sin. In fact, you know, if any man says, I have not sinned, he, he deceives himself, right? John tells us this. Uh, so we, we get it. The point is that we're stumbling along in Christ's direction. That's passing the test. The, the point is that you, you cling to the cross. The point is that it was grace that saved you, and so in the midst of your trials, you understand that you need grace and more grace. And where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That's the Christian life. Now, others blame shift. We, we learned it from Dad, right? You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And uh, Adam says, you know what? It was the woman. And the woman says, you know what? It was the serpent. And it stinks when you're the small man because you get nobody else to blame. And so the serpent's like, yeah, let me crawl on my belly for a while. So we know what it is to blame shift, don't we? And so James is brilliant, and he says, well, let me just go right up the ladder here. And you can't appeal to anyone higher than God, and so some people blame God. Right now, the trial that you're going through, the reason that you're sinning, I'm going to guess, you're blaming that on somebody else. The reason that you just had this uh, tremendous meltdown is because your spouse did X, Y, and Z to you. So catch what you said there. Because he or because she. You have essentially elevated that person to a godlike status. You have identified your idol, or at least one of them, or uh, the reason that you just lost your temper at your child, because he or because she. Look what you just did to your child. You took your child and you elevated them to a godlike status. You are building a prison for your own soul. You're saying, the reason I sinned is because. You're pointing your finger, aren't you? Well, that's very common and tremendously unbiblical. It, it is a non-Christian way of going through life. And so you can't blame anyone higher than God. James says, when you, when you go through these uh, temptations, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted of God. Well, why? Well, first of all, the, the source of sin, it's not in God. Therefore, God can't be tempted. And furthermore, because that source of sin is not in God and God is not tempted, He's not the one tempting you. So wait a second, I thought, I thought God leads us into trials. Yet, notice the distinguishing between trials and temptations here. Or maybe you could say it this way, between tests and temptations. You say, well, wait a second, didn't, didn't God test Abraham, Genesis 22, about, about Isaac? Well, sure, that was a test, but the temptation comes from Abraham's heart. Let's say that Abraham said, no, there's no way I would um, prioritize God over my child. Well, then Abraham fails the test. But the temptation's not from God. The temptation comes from his own desire. He's wanted a good thing badly. Well, you want your kid, of course, but that's a good thing. To what degree? This happens all around us, doesn't it? Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. We could really tease that out. Let no one say when he is tempted, the devil made me do it. <laughs> and don't call your spouse the devil. Let no one say when he is tempted. Some sort of environmental causation. We all agree that the environment influences us. It is not causative. So if it's not that which is around you, what's left? That which is within you. So here he goes, to continue. But, big contrast here, right? Verse 14. 
But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Let's begin at the end of that verse with that word desire, epithumia, uh, the thumas. <laughs> uh, this, this is a strong desire. Uh, your translation might have that word lust right there. Uh, if you talk to someone from the Greek Orthodox Church, they'll talk about passions. Uh, verses like this help inform why they talk about that. Uh, so accordingly, uh, someone, say, from a Greek Orthodox tradition would talk about being dispassionate. Well, we hear that and we think apathy, like without any desire. What they mean is without this type of sinful desire. And so uh, for them to be very spiritual would be to be dispassionate. When you understand it from that framework, it's actually a really helpful way of talking about things. <laughs> Too often we hear it from our own framework, so we, we don't necessarily understand what they mean. So in James, if you are uh, enslaved to these passions, what we don't mean is uh, you're so passionate about a good thing, that's how we tend to use that word passion, uh, in that you are zealous for good works, that's what we mean. What James is saying with passions is that these strong desires these, can we say this way, deformed desires are holding court on you. And it is this uh, wrong prioritization of loves, uh, the, this misordered love that leads you away. The, the word here is like uh, luring someone. Uh, the idea would be kind of like you bait the trap. Well, the trap doesn't look good, but the bait looks good. And so you ignore the trap. You, just like that animal, the animal is the architect of his own demise. And so he sees the trap. He knows, well, that doesn't look much like a tree. That looks like a green metal cage or like a, a strange board with a uh, metal floppy thing on there, right? And so he doesn't quite know why that doesn't look like a tree, but he does see the cheese. So the animal goes on and, and he perishes, right? You are lured away, you're ensnared, you're enticed. You, because of your own desires, are the architect of your own ruin. There's a story in the Bible of Achan, and it's found in the Old Testament, and as the people of Israel are coming into the Promised Land, things are going very well with uh, Joshua, with the people of Israel, and yet, one person sees that which belongs to God and wants it for his own. He hears the verdict that God has spoken, and this is the law, this is the way of truth, walking in it, and he says, I think there's a better way. And so he makes a choice. Remember, we just got done talking about what is truth, what is morality. He chooses his own standard of morality and therefore sin and really is punished for it. He sees, he desires, that's our word here in James, he takes, and then he hides this treasure in the ground under his tent. Boy, isn't that the way of sin? That once you have committed the sin, now you're so bent on hiding it. Now you have watched pornography, you're going to try to cover your tracks. Now, you have abused your child. And now you are really trying to hide that bruise. And isn't this how sin works? Maybe blaming them for your outbreak? Isn't that how sin works? You, you have misspent your money and now are really grappling with the tensions of, of scarcity and maybe now spent too much on the credit cards and are really wrestling with that compound interest. And, and sometimes you just want to blame something else. We want to be cautious here. Because sometimes there are some pretty hard factors in life. You know, maybe you had a medical emergency. That's maybe a little bit different than the person who just wanted to go on that spending spree because it was your birthday. It's not the same thing, is it? Lust ensnares you. Your deformed desires. Who are you trying to glorify with those desires? So now you have this kind of almost parasitic description of sin, that you as the host uh, are used to grow this sin and therefore uh, 
as the host, you are now eaten by that sin which is in you. It's a pretty gruesome metaphor. Uh, and yet it all comes from you. It's of your own doing. You know, the wise man, the prudent man, sees the evil and hides himself. But the naive, the simpleton, the one who really doesn't have wisdom like we talk about in James, he proceeds on and he's punished for it. A text like this really helps us understand uh, how life works, and it cautions us against playing the blame game. I would pass that on to you. Who are you blaming for the sins in your life? And if you recognize it's from your own desires, there is a solution, and it's found in Jesus Christ. Don't say, I'm tempted by God. Don't say, I'm tempted by the devil. Don't say, I'm tempted because of this person around me. But dear Jesus, would you please help me remain steadfast under trial? You know, there's a crown of life for those who endure.